Hi everyone, our guest today is kind of a big deal. He's been named a LinkedIn uh, top voice in technology and innovation. He's been dealing with things in mega breaches to nuclear weapons. He's been at the epicenter of cybersecurity. He's even a strategic advisor for the FBI. You obviously know who I'm talking about. If you don't, here's Jamil Farshi. Jamil, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Man, I, I'm so excited to get to talk to you today, but I'm, I'm really curious to know, how does somebody become who you are today? Like, what is your origins life story? Tell us your superhero origins. <laughs> I don't know about superhero, but um, look, I, I've loved technology since I was a kid. And um, it, when I was in middle school, I coded up a Frogger game for my science fair. So that's sort of how out there I was. And then when I went to college, I compromised my computer, my school, my college network. Um, and then I, because of that, I didn't go to jail. Instead, I was able to get a fellowship and do the same sort of security work for the entire university. And that sort of kicked me off. And then I went to NASA to help uh, do emerging security technology there nuclear weapons at, at uh, Los Alamos and on and on until uh, here I am at, uh, at Equifax. That's awesome. So, so you always had some kind of inclination towards breaking down security. Like how did the idea come about of you breaking down the, the firewall, I guess, at your school? Like what did the idea, was that a prank somebody dared you to do? Or you were just like, eh, I'm bored today, it's Friday, let's see what I can get away with. I wanted to uh, get my grades better. No, I'm just, I just <laughs> look, it's just, it's to me, it's fun. I mean, getting, getting into the weeds and learning how technology works and different ways to be able to break it. Um, I think you sort of have to have that little, a little bit of a roguelike spirit to, to be really good in this field and figure out what works, what doesn't. And fortunately I've gravitated to the side of what works and how we can stop bad actors. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, that's, that's, that's why I arrived here. And what was the first resource that you started tapping into that gave you the tool to start breaking down things and understanding the, I guess, the, the, the deep mechanics of security. It was my, it was, I worked at this organization called the Oklahoma Climatological Survey when I was in college and I had the best boss mentor ever. Um, he would come in, he taught me all about security. We do packet analysis together in the middle of the night. I mean, he t mainframes everything. And so he took me under his wing, taught me a ton. And I think, in large part, I'm, I'm here today because because of that guy. Wow, that's awesome. So he was like your master splinter uh, of cybersecurity in a way. <laughs> in a way, yes. That's so cool. So we're here for Cybersecurity Month, uh, you know, and having an awareness for cybersecurity in the company is really important. Can you tell us what that's all about and why that's so important for us? Look, we all, if we're going to be, if we're going to be able to protect ourselves, if we're going to be able to protect our families, our community, this company, we've got to know what the threats are and we've got to know how to be able to defend ourselves against them. And so I think this is, this month, is all about teaching everybody what the key threats are, how they can protect themselves, and by extension, how to protect Equifax and make sure that the consumer data that we're entrusted with is protected. That's awesome. No, I, I totally agree. I think it's something that becomes a much bigger and bigger concern as, as technology advances. And nowadays, cybersecurity is at the forefront of everyone's minds. Um, I'm curious to know, like from scams to identity hacks, I mean, it, all this stuff is, is essentially the crime of the future. Could you kind of break down for the audience that doesn't understand so much about that? Uh, just break down what all the types of cyber attacks are out there. It's the, it's the crime of the future, but it's also the crime of the present because <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, there, there's a handful of things that I think matter most. Number one is passwords. So there are today, 16.7 billion credentials floating around on the dark web that have been compromised through all the breaches and individual um, compromises and things like that. 16.7 billion. And what the bad guys do is they take those and they reuse them. So they get Jamil's credentials and then they'll go to whatever retailer or whatever organizations that I'm affiliated with and they'll use those over and over and over again. So you've got to be smart about password hygiene. You know, use a complex password. Make sure that you have enough characters in it. <laughs> Don't reuse the same one for every single website that you that you go to. That that's one, the passwords. The second one I think is critically important is phishing. So there's bad actors all over the place sending emails, sending uh smishing text to your phone, WhatsApp, whatever it might be, to try to trick you. And they try to get you to click on a link or to give them some information. And people fall prey to this all the time. And that tends to be the entry vector for them to do all kinds of bad things. So 
do your best. And if your gut tells you something might be off, this message isn't right, this person doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't have much validity, just, just abandon it. Do not click on links, do not provide them information. And if, just by doing those two things, you're going to be in a far better place. That's awesome. Now let's talk a little bit about the password thing because it's something that we we tell people over and over again, like, hey, make your passwords different, make them more complicated. But I've heard statistics that you know if you have a twelve character password, it's sixty two million times harder to crack than it's a six character password. Can you break a little bit down of like how that works, just to encourage people, like, hey, like passwords are. are really important. And if you just make it, you know, 12 characters long, now you're making it yourself that much safer. Yeah. So there's two ways to break a password. The first one is using something called a dictionary attack. And so what you do is you just effectively, the bad guys take a dictionary, normal words that we all say every time, all, all the time. And you just use that as the basis to then say, okay, here's Jamil's account. I'm going to use every one of these dictionary passwords. Okay. So dictionary words. So if you use one of those standard words like tree or house or you know, whatever, it's going to be compromised because it's super easy to do it. The second way is through what's called brute forcing. That way, what I do is I say, okay, I'm going to start with one character and try every single combination of that one character, then two, and then three, and then four. And that increases the amount of time. The more characters that you have, more combinations you create, the more difficult and the more time consuming it is to be able to crack it, which is why we say, hey, use use an eight, eight character password instead of a six or a 12 instead of an eight. And then the more types of characters that you use, the more difficult it becomes because you have to search through the entire range of every one of those characters, which again, creates a huge um, number of potential um, passwords that you could have, which just takes a long time to be able to compute. So essentially brute forcing is when they use some kind of algorithm to try to find common patterns. So the more I guess the bigger sequence of characters you have and the more randomized patterns, the harder it is for them to be able to break it, right? Correct, yep. That's awesome, man. So and, and that's super scary stuff. It, it seems that hackers and scammers are always finding new ways to start hacking people and creating these kinds of scams. And, and we always have to be on our toes. Based on your experience right now, what are some of the, the emerging threats that people need to be on the lookout for? Yeah, there's several of them. I think one of the ones that's top of mind is, is AI. Uh, we've all been, you know, we've all been taken aback by um, generative AI and and you know, Chat GPT and what it can do. It does a lot of good things and it makes our lives a lot easier in, in many respects. Um, but it's also a great tool for the bad guys. So if I can just go to a prompt and type in, "Hey, I want to create some new cool malware," then uh, uh, these GAI solutions can can create it for you, and so it reduces the barrier of entry dramatically. Um, to be able to just create malware all over the place. And then what you're going to expect is more attacks, you know, greater quality and things like that. So I think AI is one that we're all concerned about right now. It's still early stages, but we'll see where it goes. The other one would be the geopolitical aspect. So if you think about the, the Ukraine war um, and you think about the, the number of attacks that Ukraine faced in the, in the wake, in the beginning stages of, of, that, of that battle. And what happened at the same time was, the rest of the world, we actually kind of were able to take a breath, you know, the, because a lot of the bad actors are aligned with, with some of these nation states, particularly Russia. And mm -hmm. so their communities of, of bad guys were focused on Ukraine. That's shifted now. And so they're back targeting everybody else that's out there. Oh, and gosh. so these geopolitical um, situations change the dynamics of the landscape dramatically. But they're, the one thing that's constant is that they're continuing to improve their, their um, techniques and they're getting more and more bold. Whether you look at some of the attacks on other nation stakes, like Co Costa Rica got attacked, took their entire government out last year, I believe it was. Um, if you look at some of the attacks, Australia got hit with a whole host of attacks back to back to back. Um, there's just, there's a lot of evolution in this space and it creates a lot of risk for all of us. The one I think that, that concerns me the most is attacks on critical infrastructure. Because these are this is the lifeblood. I mean, turning on your lights, turning on your tap at your house, these are um, ripe targets for cyber attackers that could potentially affect all of us, every every citizen of the United States. So, when you say critical infrastructure, does that include like household devices that we use every day, like a ring doorbell, baby monitors, anything that has an internet device? That would be IoT. So that's a different that's a different area. So there is another class of attacks that target what we call internet, um, internet of things, which is IOT uh, devices. That includes your ring doorbell, your connected refrigerator and all that other stuff. Um, in fact, right now there are massive botnets, i.e. 
<laughs> millions and millions of devices that have all been compromised that are owned by the bad guys that they, they control, that they can then point and attack, whether it's a denial of service attack to take things out or to, to do other nefarious things that are out there because these devices are very easily compromised because they don't have great security in them typically. And so th those IoT ones are another <laughs> another whole area of threats that we have to worry about. Not just not quite as much, I don't think, as some of the other ones that I talked about. So I think the, the part that scares me the most, based on what you mentioned, if we were to focus on AI specifically, is that they can use AI to disperse malware attacks and make them easier to get, I guess, that kind of coding. Yeah. And and ChatGPT just gives that out willingly to people. So when I was in middle school and I created that Frogger game I told you about, you know, I had to learn the coding language and I had to try it and do all this other stuff. It took the 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 bar is pretty high to be able to learn how to code. Mm -hmm. With AI, you don't have to do that at all. All you have to do is be a decent prompt engineer to be able to ask it through natural language. Hey, I want you to create me a piece of malware that does X, Y, or Z. It's the barrier to entry just drops to basically zero. So the whole, you know, whole thing about the kid in his basement attacking, you know, the U.S. government or whatever. These kinds of things become like definite realities because it becomes so easy to be able to create them. So you can expect very sophisticated malware d done at scale and targeting who knows what around the around the globe. So that's scary. That is very very scary. Kids in the basement, please don't do that. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us safe. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so that's a good way to explain like how many problems we have with hacking, but what are some of the things that you would recommend for the average user out there to lessen their chances of being hacked? We, we know the password is a big thing, obviously, but maybe what are some of the resources that you use for the average user to protect themselves or at least become less of a target to all these potential threats? Yeah, I mean, so hands down, the first thing you need to do is, is, is focus on your passwords. And secondly, is make sure that you are not clicking on links that are potentially um, risky. Be smart about where you're going, where you surf, like what, what websites you, d you decide to go to. If you go to some corners, you're, you're going to be at quite a bit of risk to get malware um, installed in your system and you're potentially at risk on that one. Update your devices. You know, I know it's annoying and it's annoying for me too. You get the update and you're like, oh, I'll just do it later. I'll do it later. Just click accept and update your devices because the more update that updated they are, the less risk that, you, that you're going to be taking on because it's going to be more difficult for you to have vulnerabilities and things like that on your devices. Another one that I think is good because there are so many breaches and because we typically, I think the average person has 187 seven different online accounts is to... It, you know these organizations periodically get compromised, and they will, you know, lose all of their all of the account information, and that account information they can, that's getting used by the bad guys. There's nothing you can really effectively do about that. What you can do though is you can take advantage of things like credit monitoring. So if your credentials are compromised, if some bad actor is trying to create a new profile for you and get credit in your name or or use your credit lines you'll be able to get alerted and notified of this kind of stuff. The other one I, th I always highly recommend is to, is to work with your bank to make sure that you get notified whenever there are unique transactions on your account. And so you'll you'll be able to at least have a front row seat to things that are changing and you'll be able to take advantage of them. Finally, um, multi-factor authentication. For all of the accounts that, that allow it, um, try to in implement this. And so it's just a configuration setting. And what multi-factor authentication does is it says, hey, I might have my username and password, but there's one other thing that you need to be able to log in in addition to that, whether it's sending you a text, so you have to put in your verification code or what whatever it may be, that provides a great level of protection against some of these common attacks that we see. That's awesome. It's funny you mention it because when it comes to updating your devices, me, my very, very ignorant self, I think that I shouldn't update because I think that the update isn't secure enough. But usually the updates <laughs> are the most secure thing. You're truly next level. Then. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely update your devices as soon as possible, right? To keep yourself protected, uh, which I think is great. Um, but thanks. Thanks for saying that. I think that that helps people a ton, you know, and just giving people a list of things to keep in mind and stay vigilant on because I think these kind of attacks are going to be on the rise on, as the years come, especially because of ChatGPT, like you said. Look, they, they, it is in general because as a society, I mean, just think of your day-to-day day -day life. 
today versus a decade ago or 20 years ago. I mean, we technology, we, we're intrinsically tied with it in our day-to-day lives, whether it's watching Netflix at night or it's using your phone to check on your, t- whatever, or, or getting your, you know, doing a withdrawal from your bed, whatever it might be, technology underpins it all. And so the more reliant we are on technology, the more of a risk it potentially creates because it's attractive for the bad actors to be able to target it because they know how much we rely on it. So this is a problem today, but it's only going to become, cyber is only going to become a a bigger and bigger problem as we move forward. Can you talk a little bit more about the different types of uh, scams and attacks out there? Because I know there's attacks, for example, my ex was hit with a phone call uh, like a month or two ago, and it was supposed to be a police officer. And she checked his LinkedIn. The police officer had a LinkedIn. They had a website for the police department, and they tried to keep her on the phone for three hours to take $15,000 out of her account. So there's different types of attacks out there. What are some of those types of attacks, and what are they called? Yeah, l- let me start. First off, those types of attacks you just described, they are all too common. Um, and they, they'll take the variety of whether a police officer, it'll be the FBI, it'll be the IRS, there's a whole host of them out there like that. And I think what's been interesting to watch the evolution of that kind of attack is the level of sophistication and the work they do on the back end. To, to your point, hey, there's a website, there's a LinkedIn profile. It all looks legitimate. Like how can it be not true, right? Yes, exactly. And I think for most people, you're like, okay, this must be. But here's the thing. How often and when would a police, when would the police call you and ask you for money? Like it just, so this is when you've got to use your sort of spidey senses and say, does this really add up? Why would they be, why would they be asking me for um, a Bitcoin know, wallet? $10,000 in, in Apple, whatever those iPhone uh, cards are, those Apple, whatever they are. I don't yeah. know. Um, Some or, cryptocurrency. It's like, yeah, put $10,000 in my, my, my Bitcoin wallet. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do, they do this or, uh, or Nordstrom's gift card. Like they do this and you're like, that, why would they? That doesn't sound quite you know, right. Yeah. PDB asking me for this. It doesn't make any sense. So, so you've got, I think just using common sense and like your gut a little bit will help you avoid a lot of those things. So you've got the, you've got the phone scams. You've got the standard phishing stuff that, that we talked about earlier. I mean, there's, there's just a, there's a whole host of ways they try to, to get at you. Um, Oftentimes, and almost exclusively as it relates to cyber, they're going to do it through some technical means, though. You're going to get an email. You're going to get a a phone call. There are cases where they'll send you snail mail and have you try to do something in in that respect. But those are less common nowadays because they don't scale as well, so it's more difficult. Um, But they always involve the transfer of something that you have over to them. And they'll typically build in a pretty nice story around it to just try to make it seem more authentic. So you've got to be super careful on that one. The other one that's not so much of a scam that affects a lot of people is, is ransomware. So this is... This is a bad actor getting access to your system somehow or your information somehow, and then they lock it up. They encrypt it uh, and you can't access it. There was there was a woman. uh, I mean, this is terrible. There was a woman in my neighborhood, an old lady. She was probably in her 80s and she got ransomed. And so as the resident technology person on my block, I guess I, I went over to try to help her out. And there's nothing you can do because her. It was her, just her personal computer, had all of her pictures of her of her um, grandkids and nephews oh, and stuff no. like that. And it was all completely locked up. And the bad actors were asking for, uh, it was $2,000. And so her computer is locked up. It just shows the screen, you know, you must pay this and this is how you do it. It's through Bitcoin and stuff like that. But because she didn't have any kind of backups whatsoever, she was... She was stuck in the water. She lost you either everything. Pay or you lose it, and she she ended up losing all of that, all of that because all those pictures and memorabilia and stuff because she did she didn't have backups in place. So there's there's just a ton of ways that these bad actors are doing, it, and they do not have you know <laughs> any conscience at all. Like they will get zero you zero remorse any way, yeah, any way possible. And so it's just a it's a bad scene. So you you've got to be cognizant of the threats and just do your best to try to keep protected. That's awesome, man. Thank you. I think everybody else out there is really going to appreciate having some of this information and hopefully implementing some of this. Now, let's do a quick a, a quick lightning round for Mythbuster styles for uh, cybersecurity. This is all true or false, okay? So Mythbuster round here. Hackers only target big corporations and government agencies. True or false? <laughs> false. Huge false. false. And here's why. They... They actually try to go for the soft underbelly. It's the it's the old uh, the weakest link of the chain thing. Um, they tar- target small to medium sized businesses and individuals 
to a crazy extent. Why? Because they're soft targets. They, they don't have smaller businesses, don't have the investment money to be able to build out a security program. Like for example, we have here at Equifax. Individual consumers don't typically update their devices. They don't spend as much time because they aren't as knowledgeable about this stuff. And so the SMEs and the individual consumers, they get targeted a ton. So it is completely false that it's just the big boys in the government. So they're easier targets. All right, um, here's another one. Storing data in the cloud is less secure than on-premises storage, true or false? That's also false. That's uh, So th there was this notion going on for the longest time, especially when cloud first came out, that, oh my gosh, if I move my, my information to the cloud, it's just, it's gonna be super at risk. Anybody can get to it, yeah, it's in the it's cloud. Yeah, it's there, yeah, it's there, <laughs> it's available. Um, it's not though, Here, here's the thing. It, it, if you do it right, the cloud offers you monumental improvements over the, the, the traditional on-prem implementations. Um, you, you get real-time visibility, you get all of these new capabilities that you never had uh, at your disposal You get two-factor authentication with the cloud. <laughs> That's a big thing. <laughs> That's something you could do there too. So, so there's, this is false. There are all kinds of benefits to leveraging the cloud. Very cool. All right, last one. Uh, older adults are more susceptible to cybercrime than millennials and Gen Z. True or false? Cap or no cap? False. That is also, it's mind blowing, but it's actually false. Um, it, it, there was a study done recently um, where it showed there was a, almost a two to one ratio of um, millennials getting compromised versus versus uh, the elderly. And I think you're, at least for me, I'm like, oh, it's surely it's like my grandma who's getting hit by this stuff and she's more, more susceptible to it. But it's not true. There's questions about what the driver is for it. Likely it's millennials are on their devices more. And so just the amount of time that they are, their exposure is, is greater. But hands down, the, the, the most targeted and the most victimized are the millennial population. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking part in this podcast and educating everybody. I think this is something that the public desperately needs right now. And I'm so grateful to have somebody like you on our side who's so knowledgeable and knows all the ways to protect people and knows all the ways that people can be attacked so that we can protect everybody out there. So thanks again. I hope we have you back here soon enough. And um, yeah, man, let's do it again. I appreciate it. Stay safe out there. All right.